and welcome back to Business Focus. I'm Alina Trabatoni. In this week's edition of the show, we're going to talk to an expert in genomics about nurture versus nature and about the relevance of the environment when compared with DNA. How much does your DNA predetermine your life path and how much influence does your external environment actually have on you? And what else can genomics tell us or tell others about us? <laughs> Here to talk to, about, talk to us about this and more is Manuel Corpas, author and scientific lead at Repositive.io. Thank you so much, Manuel, for joining us here today. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. Manuel, what is the human genome? <laughs> well, the human genome is the book of instructions that determine the molecular functions that each of the cells in your body and everybody else's body have. So it's a chemical that actually contains information and we are in a situation now where that information the same that you create google maps you now can have a human genome map where you can locate specific molecular functions you can locate interesting features and in terms of this what's more important dna the genome mm -hmm. or the environment so both are important and they are both necessary for us to understand how our genetics and how the environment cause disease. Uh, I think that the main difference today is the fact that we can measure the genome. Mm -hmm. And this is something that was not possible 10 years, 15 years ago. And our ability to measure and understand the contributions of the genome to specific traits, to disease, to health, is what is conditioning this new revolution. So both the genome and the environment are important, but we are in a situation where we can now factor in what's the contribution of the genome to our health. Can you give me some practical examples for this? Yeah, so for example, if you look at your genome, you can predict your likelihood to have Alzheimer's disease. And obviously, it is a, a, a disease that is conditioned by your genetics, but not only your genetics. Uh, there are other diseases, like for example, lung cancer. You know, cancer is essentially a genetic disease, but obviously, if you smoke, it means that the DNA in your lung cells is going to be repaired, is going to be damaged, and that damage when it's then repair is what produces changes in the DNA that then lead to disease. So all of the illnesses that we have to some extent or another are conditioned by our genes and mm. the collection of all the genes is what we call the genome. <laughs> Now, you also work, you're a published author, and we'll, talk, about, we'll talk about that in a moment, yeah. um, but you also work for a company called Repositive.io. Yes. Mm -hmm. What does Repositive do? So, what has happened nowadays with the big data revolution is that it's becoming increasingly more difficult for scientists, researchers, clinicians to be able to find all of the different published research data that has been done to date. Uh, so there is a demand for data consumers to be able to find those data sets that have been produced by the data producers. So Repositive is like a huge catalog of all known data that has been published, that has been researched for the human genome to allow researchers to see what data sets are out there. And why is this important? Because you as a scientist, you want to be able to find, for example, all of the data, all of the different experiments that have been carried out for obesity, for, let's say, methylation, for your gut microbiota. So all of those data sets become important when you are then trying to advance what is currently known about those specific uh, types of diseases or questions or conditions. So how do you think, I mean, how is it viewed that genome technology will actually affect our lives in the future? So I've been working on the human genome for a long time. In fact... For how long? Since <laughs> 2009. And, and before I was already working on big data for, for biology. So my family, so as you probably have 
guided by my name is from Spain. So my family was actually the first family who sequenced their genomes and then they put their genome data on the internet. Oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> and actually you can see in the Wikipedia entry for the human genome, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's there. So we, why did we do that? Because we thought that is absolutely necessary for us to be able to understand how much our genomes can tell about ourselves that as many people as possible use and analyze our genomes. Uh, there's obviously a, a concern with privacy, you know, some people think that, oh, mm, are not people going to know about your risk and your health and all these kind of predispositions. That is a concern to me if I was you know, if I had some kind of rare genomic disease, etc. But so far, you know, I seem to be reasonably healthy. And so the fact that we understood our genomes to the best possible amount that is currently up to date has allowed us to understand, for example, that I have a risk of having prostate cancer uh, or of about 30% chance, whereas the normal male uh, Caucasian has a 20% chance to have uh, prostate cancer. And of course, that doesn't tell you much because basically what this is saying is that in a hundred individuals that have the same genome that I have, 30 of them will have prostate cancer, but you will never be able to tell which of those are the 30 that are going to develop prostate cancer. Compared to an average of 20. So, yeah. and, and so some people may think, oh, so why is this useful for? Well, perhaps it's not useful, perhaps it is. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a choice that someone has. You know a little bit more about your, your genetic susceptibilities. You can also know things that are not directly applicable to, to the clinic. Like, for example, uh, I, I've analyzed all my ancestry, and it happens that you know, I'm the, the typical Spanish, but I have 40% of my genome, which is Southern European, 30% of my genome is Northern European, I have a little bit of Northern Africa, I have a little bit of West Asian. So I think that's probably Phoenician kind of thing. So it doesn't necessarily change my behavior, but I guess that perhaps can contribute to the better understanding of myself. I have actually read somewhere that you can work out people's Geographic genetic is that actually true? It yes, sounds it's, like science it's completely fiction. true. It's completely true. Incredible. And, and in fact, this is probably the most accurate type of analysis that you can have with your genome. By looking at your genome, you will be able to know, you know, what's the kind of ancestry that you have if you are mixed race or even if you are not mixed race and, and you know some people get some surprises actually when they look at their genomes and see uh, what what genes they have and where they come from i can imagine yes. i can imagine um manuel uh, yes. your book is very interesting thank you um it's obviously not a scientific novel it's based on science yeah uh, sorry it's not a scientific book no it's a novel it's yeah. based on science and it's written by yeah. an expert in yeah. Genomics. Yeah. But uh, I even have leaflets. <laughs> have I shown you? Look, it looks wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> DNA Digest. Um, tell us about it. Perfect DNA. Yes. So one of the sort of mission that I've sort of felt very passionate about is to basically understand the extent to which this kind of technologies is going to affect us all in the near future. Because what has happened in the past 10, 15 years is that our abilities to be able to get our genome, our abilities to be able to sequence our DNA has dramatically increased, sorry, decreased its, its price. So in other words, the first genome cost something like $1.5 billion. <laughs> Today, you can have your whole genome sequence for, the, for less than $1,000. So, uh, and that's happened in the past 15, 16 years. So, is now accessible and your genome condition as i have said before your predispositions to uh, have specific illnesses but it also conditions your ability to actually react to specific therapies mm -hmm. so today precisely one of my colleagues at work showed me that there is this um, 
actress from soap opera. It came in the sun, I think, this, uh, this um, article. And it shows that she had uh, Chinese ancestry. And because she had a little bit of Chinese ancestry, uh, she's been diagnosed with lung cancer. And the therapy uh, that she's going to have is tailored to her Chinese ancestry. And it works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And your book is a speculative approach to That's what would happen That's correct. Uh, in, in everyday life. Yes, in terms of the social relationships, in terms of lifestyles, in terms of how insurance will cope with the understanding of your genetic susceptibilities, mm -hmm. and how will people relate to each other. I mean, basically, it looks at a man and a wife that have been correct. diagnosed, the man a natural lifespan of 130 That's years, correct. and the woman... 60 years or yes, something like that's that. that's exactly correct. And how, with a series of other complications yes. and social interactions, how that changes their exactly. lives. Exactly. Um, one of the things that I've predicted that will happen is that probably we'll be able to know our genetic age. So in other words, how long you will live if you were analyzed in your genes. Goodness. Well, thank you so much for being with us here today, thank Manuel. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. And thank you so much for joining us again on Business Focus. We look forward to seeing you again next week.